Hello and welcome everyone to the um, latest GLOW, the GPFF Lives Online. Tonight, we are really looking forward to our conversation with Ron Burke uh, to discuss his latest film, Terror and Hope, The Science of Resilience. Um, and um, I just wanted to let you know that um, the conversation will start shortly. You will be muted and uh, so you don't need to have your turn your video on because it will also not be visible. Um, and uh, please send us any questions uh, or comments via Facebook and we're really looking forward to hearing from you afterwards regarding the conversation. And now let me welcome Ron Burke. Ron, are you there? Hello, yeah, Ron. You probably got me. You, you got me? Okay. There we go. Okay, technology. <laughs> I know it's always it's it's great when it works well. Um, <laughs> So I just wanted to uh, first start off um, certainly by welcoming you and thanking you. We, uh, it, this is wonderful that we're finally getting to meet you because we so enjoyed having your previous film, Basketball and War. Was that back in 2015? Yes, yeah, a long time ago. <laughs> it does, uh, you know, but I've, I've always, uh, we, I'm glad we've always kept in touch um, and so uh, uh, glad to be able to support this latest film that you have. But before we, we get into our conversation, we did want to recognize um, the, the solemn day that today has been, that today was uh, the day that George Floyd was, um, was laid to rest. And um, I know I had watched uh, almost all of the funeral service and uh, it's, it's a very important moment, uh, certainly on a personal level for, for the lives that he had touched, but also so for the country and, and it, you know, it would seem even the world, the way these, you know, these protests, these peaceful protests have reverberated around the world that people are, are really realizing um, that there is a problem and that we do need to work collectively and peacefully to solve it, to bring justice to, you know, to far too many of our, our fellow citizens who haven't, who haven't experienced it. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. And it's, you know, there's been a lot of talk about is this different than past times? This is not the first time that we've experienced a tragic death like this in this country. It's sort of, you think, okay, this is going to wake people up, but there's something that seems a lot more organic this time. There's not, there's no real leadership. It's just uh, very, it just, it just happened and it spread around the world so quickly. And I, so I've, I hope that hopefully some change can happen. I do too, and I'm I'm very heartened to see all the young people out yeah. there. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, it's you know, uh, it's it's going to be their world sooner sooner than we know, <laughs> and so I'm glad to see that they are they are um, uh, at least initially, it, you know, looking as though they're going to take it into a brighter, uh, more just direction. So, um, and the connections between um, what's happening for so many people in terms of the trauma that they have experienced is, is, the, is the subject of your latest film. And since people haven't had a chance to see it yet, would you mind describing what the film was about? Uh, Terror and Hope, The Science of Resilience is really literally about that. It's uh, about the terror that uh, families and particularly children face in wartime situations. And hopefully the film offers some hope. Uh, I follow a group of researchers, a small group from Yale University, Harvard and Hashemite University who are studying the impact of toxic stress and trauma on families, both adolescents uh, and also generationally as far as how uh, extreme stress and toxic stress is defined, I think basically as severe prolonged stress. It's not quite what you think of as PTSD, but it's that level of stress over an extended period of time. And certainly with 
refugees coming out of Syria, that's the, the world that they lived in, uh, living under barrel bombs and snipers and for months or even years, and then finally making it out of the country. And there is psychological damage because of that. Uh, so I followed this group of researchers and they tried to understand that deeper and try to get a better idea of what interventions can be made, especially with the children, to help uh, alleviate that suffering and give them hopefully a brighter future. And I think there is a relationship with uh, far more than just children of war, uh, children growing up in abused homes. Uh, definitely what is happening with African American population and minority populations in this country yeah, with the, the police and even uh, with COVID-19 uh, and having more severe uh, impact of the virus on them. So I think there definitely is a lot of parallels and a lot to be learned. Um, <clears throat> and could you tell us a little bit about uh, we, uh, uh, about how you came to this subject? Your previous film, Basketball in <clears throat> War, also dealt with refugees. It was, if I remember correctly, middle school girls who yes. um, were, were assimilated into their, uh, their new Oregon setting um, and basketball played uh, an important role in kind of breaking down barriers and, and uh, teaching them how to, um, how to work as a group with people who seem so strange to them in their new strange environs, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Um, these were middle school girls uh, from uh, three different ethnic groups in Somalia, and they basically were dropped into a middle school in Portland, Oregon that had no experience, no curriculum for refugees. They didn't really have much, know what to do. A lot of the girls spoke very little English. Some had never been in a school, and they're mm -hmm. 13, 14 years old. Uh, they came straight out of refugee camps in Kenya. And that film, uh, I think you did a good summary of it uh, as far as uh, how they use the, the, the game of basketball to help uh, acclimate them to the, to the United States, our culture, the whole idea of working together, which became very difficult in that they were from Oromo, Bantu, and Somali ethnic groups where they did not get along. There was a lot of conflict between them and all of a sudden these different families are all dropped into the same housing project and going to the same middle school. So there was a lot of uh, tension and complications and definitely stress. And a lot of what they had learned in the refugee camps and in Somalia during the war uh, was brought to the United States. And stress was a big part of that. So coming out of that film, um, I didn't quite know what my next project was going to be. And then I heard one of the parents that was in uh, the, the middle school uh, told, told, turned me on to this great uh, program that the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry has. Uh, and I can't remember exactly what it's called, but the main key is it's in the evening and they serve beer. So I thought that was, that's for <laughs> me, I would go see what they had to say. And it was about, uh, the, the idea of toxic stress, and it was an introduction with what the humanitarian group Mercy Corps is doing in Jordan, working with researchers to try to understand it better and what they can do to help mitigate that stress. So that experience going to that lecture um, and really turned me on to like, okay, I want to know a lot more about this. The best way to learn about something is to make a documentary film. Uh, it's not the easiest or cheapest way by any means, but it, it's the way I found that it works for me and it keeps up my interest. If I know too much about it, then there's not a lot of interest in making a movie about it. But if I'm not an expert, but I'm actually know very little, then that I think is the key for me getting involved in making a film. So that's well, sort of how I got from the past one to the, the current one, Terror and Hope. Well, it's it's wonderful to know that that uh, um, uh, an ancient uh, libation like beer, you know, still has some kind of resonance for for bringing us into the future. So that you learned yes. about that. and and had you known about this or had this research been done for those middle schoolers, there 
that might have also been helpful to everyone involved that they had known some of the the things that that the researchers have found out now. A absolutely, absolutely. And one of the keys that Mercy Corps does in uh, their the refugee camps and refugee communities is educate uh, the adults, the parents, and the children about their own brains and what is actually going on in their bodies and in their brains uh, that's brought on by stress. And it's that knowledge that really then gives them an opportunity to help so to do some self help and with guidance to do something about it and help alleviate. Uh, uh, a lot of the impact of that stress. It, it yes, it definitely makes a difference. Um, I you know I was privileged to watch the documentary uh, before uh, our conversation. Uh, although everyone will have a chance to watch it on June 18th, and we will have a closing slide with uh, all of the information so that you can watch the trailer and uh, reserve your chance to see the film on the 18th. Uh, but that was one of the things that really touched me while I was watching it. I, you could just almost physically see a burden relieved of of the the of the young people when 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 it was explained to them that there is a real cause that it wasn't a moral failing or it wasn't yeah. them, um, you know that you know simple things that that used to be simple and easy for them are now difficult and and they knew that there was something missing and having someone calmly and with compassion explain it to them was mm -hmm. it was was the first but not the only step in that process right right um there's a great uh clip in the film where one of the researchers is explaining how one of the young boys came to her and said, you know, yeah, I know you want, we, you say that it's important for us to stay in school, but I'm always getting in trouble with the teacher because I can't remember anything. Or if I remember it, I can't get it out of my head. So I'm dropping out of school. I'm gonna, says I'm gonna go in the field and pick potatoes with my sisters like a man. Uh, and that's sort of the, the impact or the, impact of stress on the younger kids where they know they're supposed to when they go across a street look both ways but they are working more on an impulsive level and they see a friend across the street they'll just run across the street and they won't they won't think that no there might be a car company coming i need to look and there's actually in the refugee camp in uh jordan in zachary camp there's been more than one little child killed by a truck from that very reason. Um, so it does have a very big impact how they live their lives on a minute to minute basis. And I think it's very critical. And it's also, I think, really important because the stress as they, we've been finding out and not just in this study, it's become uh, well known lately that it actually can impact your genetic makeup. Your genes can actually be changed by stress. So that's one of the things in the second study in my film, they are looking into through multiple generations of uh, refugees, what impact the stress has had genetically on them, what, how it has changed their genetic makeup, and then that how that affects their children and their children's children. And I think that's one of the things that they're looking at is there is a, a cycle of violence in the Middle East that has been intractable. There's really nobody's found a way to stop it. So they're looking at maybe the biochemistry within the human body. Some things can be done to help, if not short circuit that that continual and continuation of violence, at least give an opening to be able to short circuit, to, to slow, stop it or slow it down. So it's, it's really difficult and it's very complex, but uh, mm -hmm. your biochemistry uh, is a big part of it. And that actually has an impact on why, why some wars continue to go on and on and on. And we've seen that in many different cultures and it's really hard to put a stop to it. <laughs> And it's not just the your genetic makeup and your biochemistry, but that plays a part of it. 
Well, separate from the, the research that was shown in your film, I had come across recently um, <clears throat> a concept of, of mental hygiene that, that um, is every bit as important as our, uh, you know, the kind of health hygiene that we're all learning now with COVID, washing our hands for, for, for two renditions of happy birthday, you know, yeah. that there are habits that we get into that um, that keep us physically healthy, like washing hands and cleaning surfaces and so forth. Um, but there there are also habits that keep us mentally healthy. And and the the point of the article that I was reading was was that all too often um, we don't make enough of a distinction between mental illness and mental hygiene and making sure that we are exposing ourselves just as, as we would physically, making sure that we are, um, are not exposing ourselves to, uh, to things that would bring us harm. And it was mm -hmm. a fascinating concept. I hadn't thought about it that way, but it, it just occurred to me while you were talking that, that, um, that these, these people who are in these cycles of violence, you know, that, that it re besides just being written on them, it's all they see, right? They don't have a chance to uh, to cleanse themselves of it and to and 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 to find a healthier way to express themselves because they're they're so immersed in that cycle. And that's actually one of the things that I think is a, a big purpose of what Mercy Corps and UNICEF and a lot of the other humanitarian organizations they are trying to do, as far as the children especially, give them a safe space, some place where there isn't any fear. There's no threat of violence. There's no violence even to be seen. So they can just be children. And that's something, at least with these kids coming out of uh, places like Aleppo, uh, where it's they've seen death, they've seen killing firsthand, uh, to be in a place where they can just be children and just play and the joy that uh, they can get from that. And that's part of the rehabilitation. I think that's really important. And that's something they have not had a chance to do. Well, and you capture some of the, the effects of the rehabilitation in, in the way that the art that is drawn by the children changes over the course of, 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 of the film and of their experience with the researchers. Yeah, and that's it, not unique just to the, the, the group that I showed, showed my film. I've heard that from several different organizations working with children, uh, refugee children that have come from a war zone. It's pretty much universal. They will, when you ask them to draw pictures, they will draw tanks and guns and airplanes. But after a period of time, it's almost like a barometer or a thermometer on their mental health mm -hmm. and their stress because they will start drawing flowers. The girls will draw homes. Uh, one of the girls in our film drew a house and then she wrote the names of everybody in her family inside the house and oh. flowers outside the house growing. And that took, that took a few weeks or months to get to that point. But I think it's uh, sort of taking a psychic temperature of uh, you know, where the child is at. And I've seen that mentioned uh, by other aid groups working with child refugees. It's, I think, pretty much universal. Um, and it's really fascinating. It's a, it's a, lovely, it's a lovely image. Um, yeah. and, and one of the things that, um, uh, that you and I had talked about in advance of this call is there's the research that the researchers um, had learned uh, working with the children, but there's also the way in which um, uh, medical science and the research has been affected by this compassionate mission that they are on, mm -hmm. that they don't look at these children just as a, a list of, of symptoms uh, that they do need to take into account their humanity. Absolutely. And and I, I, I expected a little of that, but it really surprised me because I found very little difference between the humanitarians and the scientists. I expected them to be pretty much coming from a different space and they really don't. 
And if uh, one of the goals of this film, I, I would love for more people that, and especially students in the sciences to think about, you can be a humanitarian and a scientist and the world really needs you. So I'm hoping that more students may, when they're you know in college, their freshman or sophomore year, think, okay, you know, I really need to sort of push my career in that direction where I can right. really help people and help the world. And, you know, raw, raw science is great. The theoretical science is great. It's important. But wouldn't it be great if you can actually make somebody's life now? So I'm, I'm hoping that might be one of the outcomes. Were there also things that, that you know, as you said, that when you were working with the folks who were the scientists and the humanitarian, were there were there things that the scientists said surprised them about their research? Um, were there any assumptions that they had had going in that that were possibly challenged by? Not not really. Um, Catherine Pander Brick, who from Yale, who led the study, she's an anthropologist, and she had ah. done a lot of work previously in Afghanistan. Um, uh, another one of them, uh, uh, Alexandra Chen, who uh, is a graduate student at Harvard, going for, I think, her doctorate at Harvard. Uh, she had done a lot of work in Africa, and her specialty uh, was uh, with children who were victims of torture, which I can't even understand how anybody could handle psychically dealing with that. And I'm glad there is somebody that can. So I don't think they were surprised at all. <clears throat> the researchers on the ground were three young women who were recent graduates of college, and they were Palestinian and Jordanian. So they were very aware of what was going around with, uh, with, uh, around them and why, and I think that's why they got involved in doing this. Um, and it also allowed them to have a connection to the people they were interviewing uh, and be accepted very readily because of who they were and their own personal experiences. And uh, that's that's terrific. And I'm I'm glad to hear there was an anthropologist involved <laughs> because that, <laughs> I, I think it is very important. Um, uh, I I my master's degree is in sociology, and I I always thought it was an interesting distinction: the hard sciences versus versus the soft sciences. Mm -hmm. When um, they're really just um, you know in uh, in the way I've moved through life, they really feel like they're the, uh, you know, just different sides of the same coin that uh, we do need to, to gather the hard data, but we also need to be able to put it into a narrative about the fuller context of, yes. of, of the lived experience of, of yes. those people. And, um, and it is fascinating to see what this research really bears out is mm -hmm. there is a connection. The context is, is incredibly important to, to uh, the physical and mental well-being of, of these folks. Um, and in terms of, of uh, one of the things why we're, we've uh, been attracted to your work at the Global Peace Film Festival is we're always looking for work that, that does a fantastic job of, of placing, speaking of context, placing a uh, an issue or a, a problem or um, a topic within a context, um, but also showing a possible model for uh, for moving forward or for for people to who watch the film to to take that model or that that direction of hope into their own lives and back into their own communities. What we call impact. So I was just wondering what your plans are, um, you know, for for getting this film out, especially now that traditional theatrical uh, screenings and festival screenings are not necessarily on the horizon. What are you know? What are the ways in which you are are getting the the film out into the world and making sure that that um, that the the message also is is resonating with folks. Um. It's several ways. I think the first thing I'm doing is I'm premiering it in a global online. Uh, it's not a festival, but it, we're just doing it. Uh, it'll be available between the 14th and 20th of June. 
Uh, it's to mark World Refugee Day. Um, and there will be now two uh, conversa online conversations. We're just adding one in, uh, out of the UK for the European time zone, because the one in the US uh, will be at a time that doesn't work well. I think it's like 2 a.m. in most of Europe. So we're going to have two <laughs> Q&As. Uh, but the film will be available for streaming for that entire week. Uh, and I think you're going to put the link up above. It's for absolutely free. Uh, my goal is to get uh, as much uh, impact leaders and people really interested in this subject. So hopefully they can help spread the word. Um, it be distributed. I decided not to wait for festivals, but to try to get distribution. And I was able to get distribution with Collective Eye Films, which is a great educational distributor of uh, social issue documentaries. Uh, so it is live now on Collective Eye Films uh, for educational distribution and institutional. And it will be on Canan Canopy Streaming which will be free to library patrons and university students uh, around the world. So very soon, uh, Canopy, I think, is going to take a month or two for to get it up and running. But Collective Eye for educational distribution is available now. Uh, I'm probably going to have it posted somewhere else where it can be streamed. Uh, that hopefully will have a bit of a revenue stream because this was something that was <laughs> pretty much self-financed, so I'm very interested in at least getting my money back on it at some point in time. And in do documentary world, that's not always something that is easily done. So that, that, that will happen too. But my first push was to get it out there so it can be seen. So that's the, the 14th to the 20th uh, in June, the free streaming is the, the goal there. And then we'll see, um, hopefully a lot of colleges and universities, because I think that's the primary um, place where it will have hopefully some impact with young students just forging their way in the world. And hopefully it'll turn some of them on to like, this is an area that really needs to be, be seeing. Um, and, I, and another thing with the general public, I definitely want that too, because I think a lot of people, they, they hear about refugees or maybe they see them on television or they see uh, uh, women with hijabs uh, walking through the, uh, the Kroger store and they're, you know, they don't understand who these people are, where they come from. And the film really, I think, gives a pretty strong, strong idea of where a lot of the, at least the refugees from the Middle East, what their ex lived experience is. And I mm -hmm. think that's really important if you're going to have acceptance is you have to have understanding and mm -hmm. they're not and hopefully not be, have refugees be political pawns uh, that are be used for a political agenda. Um, they're human beings just like we are. And I hopefully and with basketball war, that was a huge reason that I made that film is I wanted people to understand that these kids, these young girls are really no different than your daughter. They come from a different background, different culture, right. but their parents want the same things for them and the kids want the same things for their life. They want safety and an opportunity. Yes, <laughs> they do. Um, uh, and that's a, that is, that's a, a wonderful sentiment. Uh, and it makes me wonder, have you had a chance to um, to check back in with the, those girls who are not middle schoolers any longer? <laughs> uh, there's one in particular I've cut it, kept in contact uh, with, and perhaps because her goal in life was to go into uh, advertising. So uh, that uh, there was a bit of a connection as far as the media. Uh, but most of them ah. are sort of going to the four winds. Some have been married. Most and actually ended up going into community college. Uh, I think they got in free because of their, their status. Um, so I, I haven't kept that close of a connection with them um, just due to the way everybody sc scatters in life. And a lot of the parents moved out of the Portland area, uh, even a couple during the filming of our film. So it's sort of hard to keep touch with everybody. Oh, okay. No, the question is not really. I, I would love to have been able to keep in touch really. more 
that's always one of the challenges when you make a film like this is you want to well can we keep making it can we can make a new version a you know a new chapter of what's happening now but then there's right. new things that pull you in that uh, this direction or that direction but i have definitely stayed in uh, the area of telling the story of refugees this, to me that's something close to my heart and it was the basketball wars what got me there Oh, terrific, terrific. Well, and and um, do you have another project that's on the offing or are you just concentrating on on terror and war right now or terror and hope uh, right terror, now? Yeah. <laughs> terror and hope right now, I'm still getting terror and hope launched. You know, I'm open, but that fell, uh, terror and hope fell into my lap. It just sort of, it was organic. And usually I find the things where you don't try too hard that they just can't be ignored or the things that you end up doing. So we'll right. see that and we're working. I've got a public television station that's interested in a, being a presenting station for basketball and war. Oh. Actually both films, but they are especially excited about basketball and war. So that's starting to suck a little time to see if we can get something going there. Oh, get, very good. Get, get a new life for that film since it's been five years. Well, and speaking of staying in touch, since we've stayed in touch and will continue to stay in touch, do let us know when Terror and Hope is available on Canopy and mm -hmm. when Basketball and War, if it is um, on public uh, television, you know, uh, throughout the country, uh, we'd love to promote that, you know, and, and let our GPFF audience know about opportunities to revisit Basketball and War mm -hmm. and to see you know, if they miss this upcoming yeah. screen, they have yeah. another chance to see yeah. Terror and Hope. And, and Basketball War is out there. It is on Canopy right now. Oh, is it? Uh, Terrific. Yeah. Uh, Vimeo On Demand has got it also. Oh, very good. Very in good. fact, in my website, which I think you're going to put up the link, you can get information on all of those, which will be updated as new things come along. Oh, fantastic. Well, um, you know, and I think maybe the, the last thing to just uh, mention is, you know, again, it just in the way that we had started the, the conversation that that although Terror and Hope looks at Syrian refugees, there there are unfortunately victims of trauma, um, you know, uh, even within our own country, and we, we right. do need pay attention to that and maybe not just simply pay attention to it but I guess what I'm trying to to articulate and not have a, a little lump in my throat is is we we need to have a little compassion for people who yeah. are having bad who are who are impulsive or um who are uh not behaving maybe the way that we think uh, they should in a particular situation. We need to maybe take a step back and, and think about what that person might have gone through in his or her life. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, yeah, and the, the, the only reason my film's about Syrian refugees was this study was with Syrian refugees. Unfortunately, it uh, was the perfect laboratory for what the scientists wanted to investigate. Uh, but it, there's a a uh, resonance with situations all over the globe. Uh, but it's by far not the only refugee populations at all. You've got Palestine, you've got the Rohingyas, you know, and you've got uh, Central Americans, unfortunately, being mistreated at our southern border. And I think, again, if people understand a little bit more what is driving these families, maybe they'll have a little more compassion and empathy for um, helping them out. That is a, uh, that is a great note to, to end on that, that we, cause we all need, we all need a little help in our lives. Um, so thank you so much, Ron, for mm -hmm. your work. And we're going to stay in touch with you. And as you guys all see, we have put the slide up with uh, the link to ronburkfilms.com and it's slash terror and hope. Um, please check out all of his work on his website and go to Canopy, um, tell your libraries and your, you know, if, if you're listening in from a university, please do uh, check out the free screening and consider adding it to your, your library. And I wanna thank everybody for tuning in and we'll see you for our next Global Peace Lives Online. Thank you.
Thank you.